Hello, everybody. As uh, Roman has told you a little bit about me, I'm not an expert in materials, but uh, I've been designing uh, optical systems for a long time. So what uh, I'm going to tell you about is uh, what are the needs of the optical people, the optical industry and photonics industry. So you can have a good overview of our needs and so you can design better materials to fit our needs. I'll start with a small uh, introduction about the, the, this functionality, transparency. Let me introduce uh, <coughs> the technical concept of uh, transparency that is the transmittance. I'll show you the three more important factors that uh, uh, determine the transparency of a material that is absorption, reflectivity, and a scatter. And later I'll give you a, a very short uh, overview of what we call the waveform quality of a system. So you can have a good idea of uh, how we measure the quality of the system and what's the metric we use. And finally, with the conclusion, I'll show you the, uh, what's the kind of material we're looking for. So, what's transparency? We want materials to be transparent, that is to let pass through. A, a material that is transparent needs to have a, a good, uh, that's a low absorption coefficient, a low, absor a low refractive index, and a low scatter. The material needs to be transparent in order to let the light pass through. And uh, if you want to, to have uh, refractive elements into the system, you need them to be transparent. An opaque material is a material that has a zero transparency, that is a zero transmittance. A perfect transparent material could have a 100% uh, transmittance that actually doesn't exist. So, what kind of elements are we looking for? First of all, we have the external elements of the system, the, the elements that will protect the rest of the system from the environmental condition, the environment, that is the windows that are usually flat, or domes. Domes are a kind of um, a spherical elements, as this one over here. In this particular case, for example, it's a hyperhemispherical dome made of sapphire. We're still looking for the manufacturer. It's not a simple element. And because of, uh, it's so complicated, in fact, it has to be manufactured from two halves that uh, need to be uh, put it together to form this, uh, this part here. And later it has to be put to the holding structure that is a metallic part. But we also are interested in lenses and prints. Here I've uh, showed you two examples of uh, lenses. Uh, the one above is a, a visible objective that is for the visible spectrum. You can see below, again, an objective, but for the infrared, for the far infrared. Focal length for those two systems is exactly the same. But uh, as you can see, the shape of the lenses is, uh, is very different. Main difference is probably that in visible, you, you can have a, a cemented doublet, and so we have the need for this cemented glue. In the infrared, because of the characteristics of the materials, it's impossible to have uh, these uh, cemented uh, doublets, and uh, what we have is our doublets. There's always a small part of air in the middle of the doublets. We also want prints that uh, might be some of them might look uh, uh, simple from the mechanical point of view, that's just a wet or a couple of wet, but others are uh, much more complicated as this uh, erecting piece over here. All of you know that the uh, electromagnetic spectrum is a continuum, but uh, in, uh, in optical terms, we talk about wave bands. The reason is that the the atmosphere doesn't transmit all the uh, wavelengths uh, equally. There are some bands that are absorbed by the atmosphere 
and so the wavelengths are very well defined. We have the ultraviolet, visible near and short wave infrared, the mid wave infrared, and low wave infrared. Even, for example, even within the mid wave infrared, there is some uh, wave bands uh, that are absorbed, that is in this particular case is CO2. And uh, there are different materials that uh, switch for each uh, application. We have uh, optical glasses. The, probably the most well-known is BK7 from SOT, or uh, fused silica or quartz that uh, are used for uh, uh, ultraviolet or visible or near-infrared application. For the infrared, the kind of material is uh, very, very different. We have materials such as magnesium fluoride, germanium, cincelanite, sulfite, or chalcogenite that have a very uh, complex structure, very complex uh, composition. And there's one material that is silicon that is suitable only for the mid-wave infrared. And in the past, there were uh, those wavelengths were very well established, very well separated, because there were no, no single detector that was able to, to see um, more than one wavelength simultaneously. Presently, this is no longer the case. For example, nowadays we have detectors that can uh, see simultaneously in the same focal plane, both uh, long wave and medium wave infrared. And there are others that can see mid-wave infrared and short-wave infrared, one point or one, 1.0 or 1.5 uh, microns. So we're not only interested in the materials that can transmit uh, each of these waves and separate it, but as the detectors evolve and uh, better detectors arrive to the market, we are much more uh, interested in detectors that can see simultaneously all the wavelengths at the same time. So, what is the transmittance? What happens when the light uh, arrives at a, a plane parallel plate? What we have is that uh, the light incident in the, in the first surface of this plate, part of it is reflected and part of it is transmitted. At the second surface, it happens again some of it will transmit and some of it will be reflected. And this process goes up and forth again with several bumps on each uh, surface. And so some of the light will pass through at the end. So the transmittance is the ratio between the finally transmitted light to the incident flux that uh, arrives to the first surface of the, of the system. It will depend on the thickness of the material. It will depend on the structure, internal structure of the material that will produce a scatter. And it will also depend on the structure of the surfaces because there's going to be a scatter as well on, on these surfaces. Here you have several uh, transmittance for several materials. I've chosen uh, just a, a few of them that I think that can be very illustrative for the purpose of the talk. BK7, as I told you, is probably the most well-known material for a visible application. Magnesium fluoride, germanium, and silicon. As you can see, the transmittance can, goes from about uh, 40 for 50 percent for germanium and silicon up to higher than 80 or even 90% for magnesium fluoride and BK7. There's uh, something that is also, you can see it very easily, that not all the materials are transparent over all the wavelengths. You can see that uh, the transmitter start uh, usually in very precise wavelength and after, in the case of Germany, for example, you have uh, transmittance start to drop up to above uh, 10 microns. And even if uh, there's some transmittance up to 30 microns, 
the material is no, no useful above uh, 15 microns. So let's see what happens with the absorption. The absorption is, uh, uh, is the way by which the energy of, uh, of the light is, uh, is taken up by usually the electrons of the, of the matter. To, the, to deal with the absorption, what we do is to define, that's called the internal transmittance, that as you can see depends on the absorption coefficient and the thickness of the material. This absorption coefficient is a function of wavelength, and that's why some materials transmit in some particular wavelengths and some don't. Here you have for all those four materials, all of them for the same thickness, and uh, for a wavelength that is uh, within the range of application of these materials, you have here the, the internal transmittance calculated. And as you can see, the values are pretty much the same. So the first conclusion here is that once we are within the optical range of a material, of a certain material, the absorption coefficient is not the main factor that defines the transmittance of this material. Before going uh, to talk about the, the reflectivity, let's talk about a couple of factors that uh, are relevant to absorption. First of all, we have an important dependency with temperature. The absorption coefficient of all materials depend on temperature, and it increases with temperature. The important point here is that usually in military application, airborne systems or satellite systems, the temperature range of operation is very, very wide. For example, for military applications, the temperature range of operation goes from minus 40 degrees up to 85 degrees. And that is the environment. Even the, the temperatures inside the system, because there can be some uh, um, sun energy being dispersed, uh, being produced by the electronics of the system, the temperature inside the system can be high up to 100 or, or even higher temperatures. So. Let's see what happens, for example, with germanium. Germanium is a good, a very good example because uh, it's a, well, we all lens designers that work in the infrared will love germanium. It's the most used material worldwide. The reason is uh, it's very useful, it's very uh, easy to manufacture. You can diamond turn it easily. You can produce a spheric diffractive surface on it and uh, the refractive index is very high. So you can uh, correct many aberration with it. The problem here is that, uh, as I said before, the, the absorption coefficient of the anion depends on the temperature, and it increases rapidly with temperature. It also depends on the resistivity. It seems, uh, in principle, that those two magnitudes are not related, but in practice, means it, they are very much related. As you can see here, these graphs over here, what they show is that depending on the resistivity and depending on, um, on the temperature for each temperature, we have plot here, the absorption coefficient of germanium. And what you can see here is how for low for low resistivity, there's, a, there's an increase, but for high uh, resistivity, the increase is much higher. So if, if we calculate the internal transmittance of uh, uh, a total track of germanium of three centimeters, and we calculate it for several temperatures and several resistivity, you can see here that uh, for a resistivity of two ohms per centimeter, we have a transmittance of a 91%. But if we uh, calculate 
the same resistivity for 60 degrees, there's a, an important drop and now we have only 84%. If we do the same calculation for 40 ohms per centimeters in resistivity, the same, uh, the same transmitter is uh, achieved at low temperatures, but at uh, 50 degrees, the transmitter drops even, even more than uh, in the previous case. Now we have only 80% of transmittance. And at 60 degrees, this is this curve over here, there's no way to calculate the transmittance. So what we usually do is that depending on the application, we have to choose the kind of germanium and we have to define the resistivity in order to have a trade-off between the transmittance at low and high temperatures. Sometimes we have to, to accept a low in transmittance at low temperatures in order to have a certain amount of transmittance at high temperatures. There's uh, another important uh, topic that is uh, related to absorption, although it's not properly absorption, that is the emittance. This is important in the infrared because in the infrared, everything is a light bulb. In the visible, there's a, a great difference between a light source and the rest of the scene because the, the rest of the scene doesn't produce any light at all, just reflect the light from the light sources. In the infrared, everything is a light source because uh, all the bodies emit, uh, emit light in the infrared that is uh, you know, that's the black body radiation that is proportional to the temperature of the, of the body to the, fourth, uh, uh, to the fourth power due to the Planck law. The emissivity of, uh, of a surface is calculated uh, in the particular case, uh, here is the simplified equation. In the particular case of the, when the thickness of the material by the, uh, by the absorption coefficient is uh, pretty small, the emissivity of the surface is approximately this, uh, this product there. So the problem in the infrared is when the temperature raises, as you have just seen, the absorption coefficient increases and it increases rapidly. So the emissivity increases as well. But also the radiant emission increases. So what can happen is that, uh, is that at very high temperatures, the emissivity of the, especially of the windows of the system, can be so high as to obscure the scene. So no light from the scene arrives to the detector, only the light coming from the window itself. This is an important concern for certain applications such as uh, missile domes or airborne systems that are installed in airplanes that uh, goes at a speed higher than the, uh, than the sound. Because the temperature in this case, the induced temperature used to the aerodynamics of the, of the plane and uh, the, resist the resistance of the air can go up to 1,000 degrees. So, and all these systems rely on the infrared. So let's talk now about reflectivity. For that, let's introduce uh, the concept of the refractive index that you probably all of you know. The refractive index is just the ratio of the speed of light inside the, the sample with regard to the speed of light in the vacuum. The importance of the refractive index is that uh, the Snell law for refraction depends on this. this. This is just a simplified version of the Snell law when, the, when we have a sample that is surrounded by air. I've uh, put here a game for the same materials that I'll use uh, all through the presentation the refractive index. And what you can see here is that uh, there is a, a very wide range of values. Refractive index can go from 1.3, approximately, for magnesium fluoride. Most of uh, 
Optical glasses have a refractive index that is around 1.5, and for the materials in the infrared, refractive index is higher. It can be around 2.3 for thin selenite, thin sulfide, or for silicon and germanium, we have values that go up to 3.4 or 4, or 4. By the way, germanium is probably the material with the high refractive index. That's why, as I said before, we like it, because it helps us uh, a lot in order to correct the aberration of the systems. So. Why is so important the refractive index regarding reflectivity? Because as uh, you see in the first uh, view graph, when the light arrives at uh, the surface, part of this light is reflected back. And uh, the, the amount of light that is reflected depends on those two parameters, that is the angle of incidence and the angle of, of refraction. But the angle of refraction, as I have just shown before, thanks to the Snell law of refraction, depends on the refractive index. A simplified form of this equation for normal incidence, that is uh, when the angle of incidence is zero, and when the, we have a, 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 a plan parallel plate in air, it's just here. But this is just a reflection of, at one surface. If we consider all the bumps in, in way forward and, and backward, what we have at the end of the day is that the, there is not only the losses by, ref by reflection, it's not just this value is square, but this other value over here. That is slightly higher. So let's see with some examples what's the magnitude of the of these losses. For example, let's see with magnesium fluoride, and in this plot here, what you have is for several angle of incidence, the reflectance of one surface. And the two curves over there are for two different polarization states. You can see here that uh, up to 40 degrees angle of incidence, the reflectance is uh, pretty low, but above that value, it uh, starts to drop uh, quickly. If we calculate the reflectance of the total element for several materials, what we can see here is that uh, for BK7, magnesium fluoride, one element, the losses of reflectance is pretty low. But as soon as the refractive index increases, for silicon we have a loss, just one element, of uh, 46%. And for germanium we have uh, 53%. That means, in the ca particular case of germanium, that only 47% of the light will pass through. So this is the main factor that uh, defines the transparency of a material, the refractive index. If we make this calculation for five elements, and as you have seen in the, when I've shown you uh, some examples of uh, objectives, five elements is not a large number. We can have uh, designs with up to 10, 15 elements in them. For the case of uh, silicon and germanium, the losses are huge. For germanium with five elements, only 2% of the light will pass through. And only uh, taking into account the reflection, forgetting about trans, uh, absorption or forgetting about the scattering in the surfaces. This is unbearable. We cannot accept that. So what's the solution? The solution are the anti-reflection coatings. Usually, now even invisible, we have anti-reflection coating. All of you who wear glasses know it. Your lenses are anti-reflected coated. And uh, in the past, there were just one uh, one thin film made of magnesium fluoride. Presently, they have a, a lot of uh, thin films, a lot of uh, layers on them. The average transmission that as you have seen before was uh, of uh, 93 per, of, uh, sorry, 
53% for germanium. What we specify here is that uh, we require transmission for a thickness of one millimeter, that is to forget about uh, absorption, of at least 93%. And the average reflection, we have specified it to be less than 0.2%. But there's a lot of uh, information over there. Those are the requirements for the environmental survival of those coatings. We need them to stand on the lens, stick on the lens, for as long as the lens survives. So we want them to withdraw, to withstand humidity, moderate abrasion, adherence, temperature, solubility, and cleanability. And we want them to have water solubility, all are in accordance with certain mill standards that are standards in the industry. Those are the high efficiency. If uh, we are going to use, in this particular case, germanium as a window of the, of, the, um, of the system, we want it uh, to have a better quality um, optical coating and better quality in terms of durability. We are going to accept a certain drop in transmission from 99 to uh, 90%, but uh, we're going to require much more um, tighter tolerances on terms of uh, durability. That is, instead of moderate abrasion, we want severe abrasion, salt solubility, or salt spray, and something that is very uh, specific, that is the windscreen wiper action. We are going to put sun with a wiper, and we are going to to make a certain amount of passes, and at the end of the day, we don't want to have any scratch on the surface of the lens. This is a very, very tough requirement for a coating. In fact, the coatings, the, the very few coatings that can stand this are called uh, diamond-like coatings. So, there's another a factor that uh, defines the transmission of the system, that is the scatter. The scatter is the diffraction of the incident light that is diverted from the incident uh, direction. And it can be produced internally in the surface by void uh, grind boundaries or impurities, or when it passes through the surfaces due to the scratches, the, uh, the roughness of the surface, even the dust, that is being deposited on, on the surfaces. So what happens with the internal scatter? This, the internal scatter is the one that is produced by the structure of the material. You can see here that this is the incident direction in each of the boundaries of the, of the structure. There's a, a certain reflex, refraction and so what we have at the end of the day is that the exit direction is no longer parallel to the incident direction, so the light is diverted. This is an example of the, the structure of Anitria uh, ceramics, and this is produced mostly in polycrystallines or uh, in the particular case of ceramics in, at the grain boundaries of the ceramics. The problem with the internal is scattering is that uh, it's very difficult to, to differentiate between the proper absorption and the scatter of the, of the material. So the mathematical treatment of this uh, kind of scatter is just to calculate or to measure an effective absorption coefficient that takes into account both, uh, both effects. About the external scatter, the treatment is a uh, quite different, because in this case we can measure easily the surface roughness, and so it's very well established how the total integrated scatter, that is the, the total amount of light that is, is scattered in all directions in a space, is related to the surface roughness. And this is the expression, you can see here that it depends both on the wavelength and both of the RMS surface roughness. I plot here for two wavelengths, 
this is for the yes this is for the visible the central wavelength of the visible and this is for this uh, 10 microns that is the central wavelength of the long wave infrared and because as you can see here the the infrared wavelength is uh, much higher than the than the visible wavelength the in the scatter produced in the infrared is much lower than the scatter produced in the visible for the same roughness of the surface. So what's the effect of, of the scatter? You can see here the image of a, re, of a resolution chart seen by a police lens and seen through a, a grounded sample of, a, of a glass. As you can see here, after, uh, when, the, when the surface is grounded, when it's not well polished, there's no way to see any of the images here. There's no, we have lost all resolution. We can barely see any green levels in there. So when, when the roughness is pretty small, when the scatter is pretty small, the effect on resolution is uh, also pretty small. That is this area over here. But there is a, a boundary, there's a region when the, the scatter level uh, ratio to the in image intensity approaches 2.8, the resolution drops dramatically. So what, what we need to have are materials that can be polished well enough for the application, but also that uh, can survive in, in long term because this scatter is not uh, produced only by the surface when it, uh, when it is finished, when it uh, goes uh, out of the factory shop. But if you put one of these lenses in, into your system, there's going to be dust. People are going to clean it uh, not carefully and they are going to scratch the surface. And so the, the scatter is going to, to increase. If the material is, is too soft, this increase is going to be very, very quickly. And so the, in the short term, the material, the window in particular, is going to be useless. So we need materials to be hard enough to survive in long term, but uh, to be soft enough to be well polished. So how do we measure quality? In, in optics. If we have a, a plane wave that enters into an optical system and we, we have a, an image that is a real image, there's uh, the paraxial focus and um, in theory we should have a wavefront that should be just an sphere with the radius of curvature equal to this distance over there. What we have in, in fact is uh, this over here that is no longer spherical at all and this is the aberrated wavefront. We define the optical path difference that is the difference between not uh, with regard to the paraxial sphere but to the best fit sphere. Along the optical rays we measure the difference between this aberrated uh, wavefront and this uh, theoretical reference sphere. And this is what we call the optical path difference. There is a criteria that says that uh, a system is diffraction limited, that is in, in essence perfect, if this OPD is less than lambda over four. So if you recall that we, we might be considering system with wavelengths as short as uh, two, uh, 200 nanometers, the errors we are considering are pretty small. So our metrics is uh, much tighter than anything else that you might be considering anywhere else. For any mechanical element in any system, tolerances 
Tight tolerances can go as low as a micron, a few microns, and these are very tight tolerances. Usual tolerances for any, for any mechanical part uh, usually are tens or hundreds of, of millimeters. We are talking about nanometers. So it's very, very difficult to manufacture optical systems. The only way to do it is to compensate those uh, effects because you design the system, you try to correct all the aberration that is uh, in essence impossible, but even the nominal system is not going to be manufactured nominally. There's going to be some errors in the manufacture. Your radius of curvature is not going to be the theoretical radius of curvature. Thickness is not going to be the, the real thickness that you have in your papers, in your drawings. So what we had to do is to add compensators, just to add at factory level something that refocuses the system so we can achieve this value of uh, quality. The problem is that some of the errors in the, in the system are no longer compensable. For example, one of them is the homogeneity. The inhomogeneity is defined as a gradual variation of the refractive index within the optical element, and it's caused by the, the variation of the, of the composition, the chemical compositions, and some other defects, as for example, uh, bubbles or these kind of things. And the effect on the wavefront quality can be calculated thanks to this expression. This is the thickness of the material, and this is the refractive index. This is the OPD that is introduced. And so if there's a change in the refractive index and the thickness is maintained the same, there's going to be an OPD introduced by these inhomogeneities. And as I said before, it's impossible to compensate for these inhomogeneities. Another problem that arises uh, due to the structure of the material is the birefringence. This is produced only for anisotropic materials, and the problem is that the light has different velocities regarding the orientation of the light with the main axis of the crystal. For example, here we have a, a calcite crystal. When the light is aligned with the main axis, there is only one image, but when the light is uh, perpendicular to the main axis, we have two images. This uh, particular property can be very useful sometimes if you want to split the light into different uh, paths uh, with very special kind of prints. But if uh, what you want is just an image, the, you cannot accept to have a double image. And again, this uh, is non-compensable. I don't know if, uh, how many of you are uh, familiar with this plot, but it's uh, just uh, the main tool of optical design people. What we plot here is the, the dispersion versus the refractive index. And some materials have low refractive index, some have high refractive index and low dispersion, and uh, one of them is used for different purposes. One of them, some of them are used for correct uh, chromatic aberration, others for correct uh, monochromatic aberrations. But the important point here is that all optical design people rely on the values on this type of charts. When we define uh, an element, when we design a, a, a lens, we rely on the precise value of the, both the refractive index and the dispersion to make the calculation. And uh, those are the tighter tolerances we usually have, but as you can see here, they are pretty tight. So the problem is that if you're going to manufacture cyst, uh, materials, we need to have um, a very well knowledge of both those, those magnitudes, refractive index and dispersion, but we need them to be reproduced carefully from one bunch to the next. We, don't, we cannot accept 
pretty much variation on the refractive index from one batch to the next. Something else that has to be taken into account uh, with regard to refractive index is its uh, variation with temperature. All refractive index uh, change with temperature. Usually they increase with temperature. There are very few materials, CARS-5 is probably the only one in the infrared that has a DNDT that is negative. The rest of them have positive values. This means that the focal length of the, of the system is going to change. And what you can see here is that the magnitude in the infrared is uh, about 200 times higher than the magnitude invisible. As a consequence, invisible is optional to thermalize the system, but in the infrared is mandatory because with a thermal range as wide as uh, minus 42 plus 85, it's impossible to maintain the system as thermalized all along. And the problem is that with only five degrees change in temperature, the system will be defocused and will be useless for the user, for the final user. There's a, a few approaches to only three approach to compensate for the for this uh, thermal behavior. One of them is to choose different materials with positive and negative uh, uh, DNDT, so to have an optically thermalized systems. There are two drawbacks to this approach. First of all, is that um, the KS5 that is the only material with negative DNDT, with this word composition, thallium bromo iodide, it is toxic, even it's, it's a potion, in fact. It is soft, it flows with pressure, that it, it is very, very difficult to manufacture and to have a good surface uh, uh, quality at the end of the day. The second drawback of this approach is that those values over here, I have put explicitly approximately. They are approximate values. If you look into the literature, each source will give you a different value. And all of them claim that they have done the, the right measurements. So they are very difficult to characterize. But what happens if you decide that the germanium has a DNDT of 400? and you define all the system, you decide all the manufacture relying on this value, and at the end of the day, the reality is, is not this, and it has a, a DNDT of, let's say, uh, 440. Your system is not going to be longer, any longer thermalized. So what usually, uh, the most useful approaches are to do mechanical thermalization, that is to move one lens to continually refocus the system. Usually this can be done either um, with passive or active. The passive relates again in mechanical properties of some materials. The active is uh, more accurate because there is a motor, there is an algorithm, there is an electronic that controls the movement of a lens. but what you can see is that the, the look, the final look of an optical system that uh, was, in this particular case, there are only three lenses. This lens, this lens, and this lens over there. You see how the mechanic, how the housing is complicated because of this problem. Something else that has to be taken into account about the DNDT is that depending on the, on the thermal conductivity of the material, if it is not high enough, we can even have gradients in the lens that produce a nasty behavior with regard to the optical quality. And finally, let's talk a little bit about the manufacturing tolerances 
I've chosen just one example, a germanium singlet. This is the standard drawing for a lens with uh, all the tolerances defined according to the ISO standard. You see that we define ref the radius of curvature, the effective, the clear aperture of uh, each surface. We have here something that is very specific, that is the the alignment of this surface, that is where the lenses is going, is going to be held into the, into the mechanism. And this is the, the perpendicularity of the surface with respect to the optical axis, that the optical axis is in fact an entity that is the, the line that passes through the two centers of curvature of those two surfaces. Here we have the uh, tolerances on the surface form. We allow for this particular surface five fringes of power and one fringe of irregularity. Each fringe is a land over two. And uh, the problem with the irregularity is that it's again non-compensable. We have uh, the weights, so the the surfaces are no longer to be parallel once they are manufactured. There's going to be a certain weight, a certain tilt, and this is going to produce aberration into our system. So we tolerate, we, we put a tolerance on them, and the, in this case, we have two minutes of arc in each surface. And over there, we have the, the defects on the surface, that is uh, a scratch and digs and chips outside the, the clear aperture. We define Finally, all the surface to be grounded because we don't want any scatter light, any, any reflection on this surface coming into the final image. But we want the surface, the optical surface to be well polished. This is the P over here. And those uh, samples here define the, the, the coating we are going to, to put into the system. So to conclude. What's the, the ideal material? What are we looking for? The answer is not, uh, is not simple. You have seen sometimes we want very high refractive index materials because they are very good from the optical point of view of the correction of aberration. Sometimes we want uh, low refractive index because the transmittance is uh, much higher. So, so as I said before, the, the answer is not simple. But there's a few, uh, a few directories that can be set. Of course, we, we want a low absorption coefficient, and we want a low variation of this absorption coefficient with temperature. We don't want it to be by refringent in the special crisis when we are talking about imaging systems. We want a low DNDT. And we, ha we want to have a very good homogeneity. But there are some other factors that need needs to be considered as well. That is the manufacturability, as I have mentioned. We need to have a very well manufactured systems, very well manufactured elements. This uh, is not only the surface, the element, the, the mechanical tolerances that are uh, implicit in the element, but also we need to have coatings available for each material that you develop. There are some issues regarding the environmental condition as well, and I have mentioned here just a few. There's not only the salt spray, there's not only temperature, there's also shock and vibration. There's also radiation effects. The radiation is going to increase rapidly the absorption coefficient of a material, for example. We have the hail. The hail for the systems that are airborne, for system, for missile system, can damage completely a surface. And finally, we have the cost. Materials for the visible are so cheap that uh, if you are going to develop a material that is uh, has very good transmission only in the visible. Unless you can produce it so cheap 
is useless. And it's useless because the cost of the optics is, uh, is very high. So what if you want, probably the best approach is to focus on infrared materials or to add value to your materials, that is to, to give us materials that, are transmi that has very good transmittance over much larger wavelengths. There's a few references that you will uh, find later on the, on the proceedings. And that's it, thank you.